Okay. So, first, disclaimers. I am. Uh, that's a bit obscene. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm a little bit of a lawyer. Don't play one on TV. But, um, it doesn't matter. You can still talk about this stuff. It's not legal advice. It's not any of that stuff. But, it's good to discuss. It's good to come up with ideas. Law probably isn't as concrete as we think it is anyway, so it's, uh, it's good to talk about these things and at least come up with ideas. And, and certainly, if anyone in here is a lawyer, that's good too, but I am not. So, what's a trademark? A trademark is a logo, it's a name, or it can be a phrase as well. Um, the point of a trademark is to show a dis to create distinctiveness for a product or a service and to show the origin of that service so that you know that if I get a Coke that is actually something from the Coke Corporation and not from the local drug dealer or anything like that. Um, or some more, you know, that Coke is not Pepsi and that these things are different even though they might be similar products, you know, where they came from and who the producer is and you can base your sort of you're supposed to be able to base your consumer judgment based purely on the the logo or the trademark or the, the name of the product. Okay, so uh, the trademarks have to be used, or they can be lost, they can be defended. I'll turn this into more. So, trademarks need to be defended, or they can be lost. So, companies that, that have trademarks need to actively pursue anyone who uh, use the mark in a way that they don't like, or that use it in a confusing manner, um, if they want to keep the mark. Okay? And there's something called genericide as well, where the mark becomes a generic term. So if you let the mark be used in other products or services, or as sort of the the common refer to the pro to the type of product it is. So if you think of Band Aid or Kleenex, those are actually become more popular than say bandages or facial tissue. People use Kleenex more than they use facial tissue. So this is very problematic from a trademark perspective because it's not actually referring to the product that uh, it's not referring to the specific product anymore, it's referring to the actual, uh, sorry, the specific manufacturer's product, it's referring to the actual uh, product itself in general. So this can be a cause, this can cause a lot of problems, it can cause actually uh, the trademark holder to lose their trademark if it ever came to court or something like that, because it can be argued that this has now become a generic term for the product and not actually, isn't actually distinctive anymore, isn't actually, uh, have, you know, isn't actually associated with the manufacturer anymore, it's just a name for the product. So this is something that's, this is something why you have to defend the mark as, uh, as much as possible. So there, in general there are two types of trademarks, there are unregistered ones and registered marks. An unregistered mark, so that's a little, these little symbols, that's what they mean. This is unregistered and this is a registered. And the difference is, an unregistered mark has um, the unregistered mark is not registered. You don't have to pay money to use it. It's just uh, through use. If you if you if you create a product and you start to use that name for the product and you start to associate it with a, as a trademark, use as a trademark, you probably want to put this little TM there to start sort of. Uh, marking your territory, I guess it would be. And it doesn't require you to do anything else, you just need to start using it and claiming it as a trademark. And, and obviously, hopefully there's no other trademarks associated with that, that sort of type of product or anything like that, because it becomes a lot harder to defend later on, but really just underestimate trademark, you just use it. It's purely through use. You don't have to do anything, and it's there. It's sort of like if you create you create the product, you don't have to register the well, most, most jurisdictions don't have to register copyright, so it's the same sort of thing. You don't have to register uh, an unregistered mark. That's why they're unregistered. Um, so they're, these are really easy to obtain because it requires basically no effort. 
uh, you should probably find, you need to find out if anything else is using a similar name in the same sort of product space as the one you're, you're working in or else you're going to have into problems later on. But it's very easy to use. So a registered mark is something that you have to pay money to get. And you generally have to register it in multiple jurisdictions. So you, you, can't, you, know, you can register the mark in the United States or in Britain or other, other countries, but it's usually a, a sort of a per country basis that you can register the mark in. It costs, I don't actually know, several thousand dollars, I'm, I'm sure. I think some of the same Britain is about a thousand pounds, maybe two thousand pounds. But uh, it costs quite a bit of money. I think in the United States it's closer to ten thousand dollars. Um, but it costs a lot of money to register and be. Thank you. <laughs> Costs a lot of money to register, and uh, but they afford a lot more protection because now it's sort of it's on the books. People are it's considered a, a registered mark, and you're gonna have a lot easier time in a court case actually defending it or actually getting uh, people to stop using your being able to force it, enforce it against other people. Um, so yeah, so the, so the registered and unregistered laws are apparent are fairly uniform internationally as far as my research has determined uh, China doesn't actually have unregistered trademarks so you need to so that doesn't work in China and probably a few other countries but China being the, the large one that most people be worried about and so trademarks particularly can't cover functional aspects of your product so if the product needs to be named so if your product needs a particular name to function, so if, if say you were a program that needed to be called, like it, if it checked its own name to see if it was uh, called FUBAR, and it wouldn't run if it wasn't called FUBAR, then you couldn't enforce the trademark, you couldn't have the, someone have to change the name to something else because it's actually tied to the functionality of the product. So this is for, so if, if, if the, if the name is any way tied to the functionality of the product, it needs to be named something to work properly. If it needs to have some logo that would work properly, it can't. It would be very difficult to, to say, uh, to enforce it as a trademark as well. You couldn't compel someone to remove the trademark if it actually depended on the functionality of what you were doing and what you were using. So that's the decentral of trademarks. So we're going to go into some of the trademark problems that are been, I guess, happening in the open source community in, in general. So um, these ones are more upstream. Uh, two really recent examples are Ethereal and Game, which became Wireshark and Pigeon. I think I pronounced that right. Um, so, so in both these cases, in this case, the developer was uh, working for a company, and the company actually held the trademark for Ethereal, and then he left the company couldn't actually secure the rights to the trademarks. So when he left, he changed the upstream name to Wireshark to avoid any sort of conflicts and stuff like that. And in the case of Game, uh, AOL, in fact, came down fairly hard on, on the game developers. And uh, I think there's fairly long, protracted negotiations and stuff to, to be able to, uh, to see if they could use the name, which they couldn't. And eventually they had to change it to, to Pigeon. That was, that was also done behind closed doors. I don't actually know the details of that. But uh, it took a while. So these aren't really that. This is not really a big problem for that being itself. Um, I mean, obviously, having to create, having to change the name of the packages and having to go through a lot of uh, kind of busy work is annoying. Uh, to say the least, and it would be great if we had easier ways of renaming packages and having the upgrades be very seamless and not have to create sort of these funny dummy packages with the, with the existing name, but we don't really have to do that right now. So uh, another example here is programs with trademarks in Debian. So Apache and OpenOffice.org both assert that they had trademarks on the terms Apache and OpenOffice.org. And uh, in fact, 
fact, the Apache 2 license explicitly says you do not, this license does not confer any rights to the Apache trademark or the sort of feather logo that they have. Um, so we have been distributing these things for quite a while now. And it's interesting that, as far as I can tell, I couldn't find any reference to the, any discussions about the, the trademarks, in fact. So uh, it's a bit puzzling, I guess, in that we, sorry. In that we don't have uh, any sort of formal agreement with Apache or OpenOffice.org to use their logos and their, their trademarks in the programs that we distribute. But we do it, and they're not complaining, and we're certainly not complaining about it. So I'm not sure exactly. Probably nothing needs to be done there, but it's interesting to see that there are projects that have trademarks that aren't burdening us with additional terms or conditions or anything like that. Right, so it's interesting to contrast this with our approach to copyright, which is that where the copyright license on the code is unclear and we don't feel that we have a proper license, we will typically not include the software at all. Yeah. And the reason for the difference is that if we come up with some problem later that's a copyright problem, we end up having done all the work for nothing to have to throw the program out at that point. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's just a trademark problem, then we can fix it just by renaming it, which is a pain, but there's no point doing that pain now if we could get away with doing it later. Absolutely, and I mean, it's also been unclear, like it's sort of, it's, 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 it's similar to our stance on patents, where we sort of ignore the problem unless someone explicitly comes to us and said, says there's a problem. Even if we sort of know that there's a patent on, on something, and, and we certainly do know that there are patents on many things in Sinai and, and uh, that cover a lot of the programs, we don't, necessarily take any action until someone points out there's a problem. So, yeah, it is, it is quite a bit different than the way we can call pen copyrights. And uh, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it's just interesting to point out that this is what we're going, this is what happens and, and it, it sort of seems to work for the, at least these two very popular programs. And then, <laughs> this was a recent case. Where uh, it was a bit, it was a bit crazy. Um, I don't know if anyone followed this, um, followed this mailing list that, that happened on the, the Ion3 mailing list. Uh, the Ion3 maintainer or upstream rather, upstream author. I can't remember his name now. Something from the end of uh, Felt that 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 uh, the true type font engine in in, uh, in the X true type libraries did a horrible job of rendering fonts. So he explicitly didn't include support for it in Ion 3. And a lot of sort of but a lot of people disagreed with him and so told him, I think it was I think Slackware was the, the one that sort of fueled all this. But the, the Slackware package for for uh, for Ion 3 contained a patch to let it use XFT instead of just regular bitmap fonts. And the maintainer sort of asserted that uh, This was this was too too radical a change for it to be called Ion three anymore, and that he asserted that he had the trademark on Ion three, and that anything that had this patch in it did not call itself Ion three or include Ion three in the name of the package or in any way refer to Ion three, and proceeded to then have a crazy sort of diatribe about the evils of open source software and how it's stealing people's work and. You should really look it up. It's it's quite insane. He really kind of went mad, or at least started becoming a, a huge <coughs> troll, and just was unbelievably uh, inflexible about the whole thing, and really lost his mind. <laughs> but I mean, so yeah, the, the, the problem here too is that he can now he can now, I, I think uh, in Debian we're actually going to change the, uh, the name as well. I haven't actually kept up with the the latest on that, but I think we're going to have to change the name because we incorporate some changes too. I'm not sure if it's the XFT change, but we have some other changes that, uh, it also seems kind of ridiculous that we can't port these little useful patches into the package. So there's a lot less recourse here. If, if he sort of, if he had gone off the deep end and said, my package is now under the, you must send me $50 license, uh, we could 
it would be fairly easy just to take the latest version and continue to work with someone else, but and but now we can't really. I mean, we can now continue it, but we've lost that sort of the branding that Ion three was, and we can't. Uh, we're going to have to come up with a new name, or someone's going to come up with a new name and continue the work and probably possibly fork it off into different branches. Obviously, doesn't want to include a lot of useful upstream patches or downstream patches rather. So this is another kind of crazy example of. Somebody using trademarks to try to compel developers to not change his code or not to do things with his program that he felt were, you know, not in keeping with the spirit of his program, but yet are are something we take for granted when we talk about open source licenses. Something that are easy to do and is almost encouraged by things like GPL or other things like that. So it's kind of it's very interesting. And to come to ice cream as well. So this, this is, a, this is the, the situation I guess I had the most um, experience with, uh, being sort of directly involved in in the, the renaming of Firefox Ice Weasel and Debian. Uh, and so for people who don't know the history, I guess, I guess in I'm sure it was 2004, 2005. But uh, what was then the Mozilla Foundation came to us and said uh, they weren't happy that we were calling our version of Fire Firefox Mozilla Firefox because it hadn't come from Mozilla, it, come from, it was being distributed by us. And they were also sort of, I think they were a bit unhappy that we, were, we weren't using the, the, the actual Fox logo that, uh, that's become very popular. And, uh, and the reason we were using that Fox logo is because the license on both the copyright license and the trademark license on that logo are non-free. So it doesn't actually allow you to modify it or do any of the things that, that we would expect from a copyright license in something in Debian. And uh, I mean, that's the, the exception of the whole source code is that this one sort of graphic is not free, the rest of it being sort of GPL and MPL and trial licensed. Uh, and, um, so eventually we came to an agreement where we could use the term, they, they, they wanted us to drop the term Mozilla, but they said that it was all right if we still continue to use the word Firefox, and uh, that we could not, we didn't have to use the logo because of our objections to the, to the copyright. So it was, anyway, much discussion. You can look up the band list threads about this, and there was, there was lots of discussions going on and about, uh, about what we should do, but in the end, that was, was decided it was a good compromise that we could we could do that and, th and they, they said they would uh, monitor the the quality of our package from time to time make sure that it was up to the standard that they felt that the trademark deserved and that it was still a, you know a good package and it wasn't too divergent from what they considered for Firefox to be so I went I went ahead and renamed eventually renamed the the, uh, the package name from uh, Mozilla Firefox to Firefox, and and uh, all the you know the Fox logos were stripped out, and then <coughs> that, persist, that persisted for about a year, I guess, that situation, and eventually the trademarks for the Mozilla, all the Mozilla trademarks for Firefox and Mozilla, got transferred to um, the Mozilla Corporation, which was had been created I, I, to <coughs> receive money from various corporations and. And to actually hire developers to work on Firefox and to you know, pay people to, to do this sort of thing. And they came back to us and said that uh, that now it wasn't permissible to use the Firefox name without using the Firefox logo. And uh, again, large large mailing list started to ensued and and we explained to them that we couldn't use the logo because of the non-free copyright, the, the, the copywriting, the sorry, non-free copyright on the, the logo. And they said that they felt that because it was a trademark, that giving away the ability to create derivatives was uh, weakening the brand and weakening the mark and various things like that. So they wouldn't budge and being Debbie and we wouldn't budge. <laughs> So uh, 
we were forced to rename it to something else. There is another thing that they wanted. Um, That's true. Which is that they wanted essentially all of the patches that Debian applied to its Firefox package to be approved by them. Um, and they asked the same thing in Ubuntu. Now, Ubuntu have actually gone down that route now, and which is why the Ubuntu Firefox package is still the Firefox still. Um, in practice, that kind of patch approval process was uh, more of an annoyance than a serious hindrance. Um, but I did find myself, I was at the time, and sure, you know, I, I, around about this time I stopped being the Ubuntu Firefox maintainer. And I remember having, you know, being distracted from doing useful work by having to justify certain changes and why did you do this and then have an argument about it and stuff like that. Right. Really, and, and I didn't see what happened to most of the, the, the sort of puff case changes. There were some changes to things like, you know, the default um, latest headlines thing and the bookmarks and those kind of things which were really very sensitive from their point of view and um, I got quite out of the loop on those discussions so I don't know exactly where that's all gone. Um, so that for Debian was, it was quite clear, right, if it had just been the logo that was the problem, it might have been possible to come up with some fudge. But really they were saying we, we needed, Debian needed to approve, have all the patches approved. And uh, really they were saying at that point, on, in public at least, that they would need to be pre-approved. And as a kind of, obviously as a just general workflow thing for Debian, that would be impossible. And in any case, that really isn't free software anymore if we have to ask somebody's permission. Right, I, I, don't, think, I don't think it would have been impossible from a workflow position, but it would have been, again, annoying, and yeah, this, at this point it's becoming not, yeah, it's the fundamentals of free software are sort of being co-opted purely to have the name of the package and the, and the branding to be consistent with what they think is good, and, and it's, and it, I mean, it, it's a hard decision because it's, a, it's become, they've spent a lot of time marketing it, and they've spent a lot of resources and effort, and people are very excited about it, to have an alternative, and even on Windows it's become very popular, so people know about it, and it's hard to want to, to get rid of that sort of free publicity where we can say, you know, Firefox is in Debian, and then people know what that is, and can be more attractive to Debian just because of that, you know, the, the allure of that name, and what people think, and Ice Weasel obviously has less of an allure. So, to get back to the, the, the story, yeah, so, we decided that this was not free thinking, and uh, that this was uh, this sort of having to sign off on all the patches would be very uh, non-free software and burdensome. So um, we looked around, and, and in fact, when this when the issue had come up the first time, we had uh, was it Nathaniel Nerod, that's his name, had come up with the name Ice Weasel in case we actually had to eventually changed the name, and I think he was sort of suggesting it as a joke, but it actually came to be known as, even the Mozilla people started to refer to in their trademark doc, their trademark policy document, the Ice Weasel Clause, where uh, <laughs> where people could, you know, rename, you know, if, if you need to make massive changes, you had to use some other name, and they actually refer to it as the Ice Weasel Clause. Well, so, it would become famous enough, but we won't have a problem about not having an allure. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the fact that it was actually being used as the sort of the, 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 the not Firefox name uh, gave it a certain amount of popularity initially and, and I actually threw up sort of an informal poll on my blog to see if, uh, what the next name should be and, and overwhelmingly it was, that was the one people voted for. Uh, it does lack perhaps a bit of sexiness and a bit of uh, appeal but people already knew it and to some degree it was associated with Firefox so uh, it, I guess it made sense. It was a bit complicated because the, the GNU project had actually created a, a free version of Firefox that was called Ice Weasel with a capital W. Uh, and, or, sorry, G no, GNU Ice Weasel. And, but and then they see the No, 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 no. no. They, they, uh, but uh, because of the popular name, we went with it anyway, and in fact, the 
as far as I can tell, the mini autism project has completely stagnated and hasn't gone anywhere. The last time I looked, which admittedly was several months ago, but it was several months after the 2.0 release, and they were still sort of packaging a, a 1.5 Firefox with the GNU release. So yeah. So, uh, GNU ISO has nothing to do with our name. Sorry. I mean, I mean, our ice whistle and the Guinea's ice whistle have nothing to do with each other. They have other. nothing to do with each other. Right? Okay, because in, in Guinea's developers, they asked me once that if uh, some people from Debian has re have reported some problems with Guinea's, and they and they said they thought it was because uh, we uh, we were stuck to ice whistle, which was uh, version of 1.5. Uh, okay, uh, that's stuck. Right. So I mean, it's confusing for. It people. is slightly confusing. And Perhaps I should have chosen, it, or we should have chosen a different name just because of that, but because it was so popular, I thought, and because it had actually originated within our project that it seemed like we had claim or something like that, so. More, that, moral rights. Moral rights to it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I think my favorite was, in fact, Free Fox, but I thought, again, that would be, uh, that would be too close. a bit too close to what to the original Firefox and the Muslim developers could complain a bit and people weren't happy about that. So I wanted to make sure it was reminiscent of the original name, but you know, impossible to confuse with the original name. So, so <laughs> notwithstanding the patch situation, has there been any consideration of modifying the FSG to allow branding elements to be not completely non free? Uh, no one has proposed that, as far as I know. I think, given the way that recent GRs have gone on these kind of subjects, it's very clear that such a proposal would fail. What, so if Ubuntu keeps the name Firefox, they must um, not uh, modify the branding elements. That's so the, 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 if you look at the, the, the free software guidelines and the guidelines in Ubuntu, they're actually a bit weaker than the DFSG. DFSG. DFSG, yes. Uh, and, and a lot of these yeah. questions are to do with the way that the guidelines are applied anyway. And Debian tends to take quite a hard line, and Ubuntu take what they would describe, I suppose, as a pragmatic line, <laughs> as the rest of us might think of as weak. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, the Ubuntu guidelines say that the it's like they're explicitly saying the software, like software only, it must be free, and everything else is sort of. I can't remember what the exact wording is, but it's much, it's like on a case by case basis or something like that. They will make these sort of decisions about what, what to be included and whatnot. It's much more. Of course, I, I'm quite sensitive to this because I'm very keen on getting uh, OpenJDK or open source Java into Maine mm -hmm. and have it pass our compatibility kit so that it could, it could be branded Java compatible TM mm -hmm. so that people could recognize that the JVM and Debian like Firefox is something that they know and they recognize. Right. right. Um, I suspect that <coughs> some trademark people would not really be thrilled about uh, allowing people to modify the Java compatible Pepinstein logo, for example. Right. So I, I think there are some detailed discussions there that maybe would be better had later in this session or in a kind of corridor conversation. Yeah. But uh, I don't think that Debian's requirements are inherently incompatible with Sun's requirements here. So I think a compromise should be possible. Great. And in fact, if, if we can't end up using the, the Steam logo, I think Sun was actually very generous in that they the little Java Duke logo is in fact very liberally licensed. That's, that's James Gosling. He licensed it under BSD, so you yeah. can go so to town with Duke exactly. so imagery and 3D models. And right, so that would certainly be an excellent replacement that would be, you know, would be a very easy replacement to make, I guess, or, or somewhat, something that's still very much associated well, with Java. Oh, it could be. Jeff's Duke is definitely associated with Java, but it, it's not Java branding. So. Sure, sure. Absolutely. So yes, I think I've said enough about this. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is this is still kind of a unique situation. I don't I don't think there's anything quite like this has happened. And again, it was it was as complicated as sort of mix of copyright and trademark issues that we couldn't get them to to uh, to reconcile. I guess even though probably you can quite easily. Have a free trademark, a free copyright license on something, and still have a more restrictive trademark license on that. 
that same thing because they are not the same thing. Patents, trademarks, copyrights, and they get branded as intellectual property, but they really have, they're not interrelated in any way in the law or anything like that. So, maybe one day we could make that, but it would have to be. So, I guess the question is sort of what do we do in these sort of situations and how should we be making these sort of decisions uh, when this sort of trademark conflict comes up? So, I guess our, our, our real guiding document in the project and the thing that we can, that most of us agree on, at least in principle, is, is the DFSG. And the DFSG was written with copyrights in mind. So, it doesn't really necessarily apply to trademarks and, and patents or other things. But it is certainly a document that describes sort of what we consider our values to be. So it's quite possible to use it as sort of, to use it for our decision making and maybe not necessarily have to follow it to the letter or follow it as strictly as we do for copyrights because copyrights are quite a bit stronger than trademarks are. I mean, the worst thing that can happen with the trademark is like if you remove some graphics, we have to change the name. And certainly, if something's a useful piece of free software, as Firefox Ice Weasel was, uh, some people actually call for its removal based on the fact that the trademark wasn't free, and that seems a bit uh, a bit too strong a reaction considering how many people use it and how useful this software it really is. So, and in fact, the DFSG actually has a provision for this in the copyright license, I guess, that uh, DFSG 4 says that you can be, if the license can compel you to, uh, to change the name or the version number based on whether you've changed it or not, or whether you've redistributed it or not. So that sort of non-freeness, I guess, or the, the fact that you're forced to change the name of the program is sort of condoned by uh, this free software guideline. So it isn't really a reason to think it should be condoned for, for trademarks as well. Um, again, our current strategy for the for trademarks is the, the ostrich method, where we sort of ignore it and bury our heads in the sand and and not care until someone actually brings it to us as a violation or a problem. Which is really how trademark law, law works in that the, the trademark owners have to police their, their marks and they have to be the ones to come to you with problems. And uh, I, actually, I don't know if there's actually willful infringement damage as I think there are in patents where if you actually knew you were doing it, you could get sued more, but certainly uh, that would be a slight it's possible that that sort of thing exists, I don't actually know, for, for trademark law. Um, the other thing is that because things like package names actually have a functional aspect to them, uh, it's not so much covered by trademark law, or it probably shouldn't be. Needed. And even the Mozilla, I think unofficially one of the Mozilla, the, one of the Mozilla maintainers, uh, one of the Mozilla upstream authors actually, Mention this to, is it to you? I can't remember what yeah. I'm saying. That the package name, because it has this very functional aspect within the package system, I mean, it's, it's used to resolve dependencies and it's used in, in this fashion, we could theoretically get away with keeping the package names the same, even in the case of a trademark dispute. It would be confusing if we had to change them. It would be probably fairly confusing if we changed, if we kept the name of the package and had to change all the names within the program to be something different. But in theory, we can do this, and it allows us to do things like have an upgrade package to be able to get to the next version. So there's still there's still a Firefox package in Debian right now, or maybe it was been I think Mike Bennett really removed so the last release. Allows us to provide a file called user bin Firefox that does something. Useful. In fact, yes, that's true too. Because these are part of the functionality and not tied to the name, or I mean, not protected under the trademark because you can't the trademark law can't force you to do something. If it will adversely affect the functionality of the program, I mean probably or the compatibility or something like that. We should, if we can, we should probably still keep the Firefox package just because if some like random user, completely unaware of everything, mm -hmm. installs Debian and looks for Firefox, at least he will find him like, oh yeah, I'm going to install this ice reason and right. you can ask him some. If yeah. if we say that that is the reason, the probably enough. if we say that that is the reason why we are including the Firefox package in Debian, then 
that motivation that that is a violation of the trademark mm -hmm. because precisely the trademark is intended to stop people who are looking for the trademark thing finding the thing that's not the trademark thing oh well, yeah i think right. I there's some, some, like there's some you know recent case law surrounding google adwords is very interesting in this context but maybe this is a bit too detailed for this oh yeah this no, i've read about that too right. um, but if we keep the package name in because there are other packages, other software that depends on it, then that's not a violation of the trademark because it would break if we removed it. Um, so you're saying you could not publish, for example, a web page that was a cheat sheet between Game and Pigeon and Firefox yeah. and Ice Weasel because that would be... I, I think that would be all right on the grounds that you're clearly distinguishing the two things. Right, so if, if you're doing that, then you're not confusing the two. And if you have a meta package that's functional, so that's okay. It's, it depends. It's it depends on what's functionality. Because I think I think the right answer in this case is from, from Debian's actual practical point of view is, provided we don't make the upstream too upset, then nobody will get sued. And this is not something that we would like SBI lawyers to be trying to argue in court, because it's very much a kind of grey area. So. User bin Firefox, that's very clearly functional. If we change that name, lots of stuff will still break, and it will keep breaking forever. So obviously, we're going to have to keep that forever. But the transitional package, um, really, the best thing probably to do is to keep it until somebody complains. And to clearly mark it, uh, mark it as transitional, even if it's long lived. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I mean, the thing is, is that we're allowed to. I mean, this doesn't force us to lie about its origins. We can actually say. This is based on Firefox in the package description. We just can't claim it to be Firefox itself. It's perfectly all right to, to use the mark in that sort of way. But in fact, I, I think your description includes the Firefox. It does say that. It says this used to be called, this used to be named for, this is based on, it was a little Firefox or something like that, and Firefox itself. And it used to be called these other names because <laughs> Firefox had a long history of changing its name. Yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, so I mean, Hopefully, there should be ways to find it if someone does a search for Firefox to come up with Ice Weasel, because they are, it is based on that. And in fact, it is largely the same. In fact, Ubuntu <laughs> made more changes to the package than we did, and we're still called Firefox, and other, other packages have done similar things. So, right. I, I, the Ubuntu package now has fewer patches in it than the Debian package, <coughs> because it's no longer derived from Debian as a, as a sort of straight cascade. Okay. But I mean, functionality. I, I mean, from the user perspective, it seems to have still more changes, I guess. Because some of the Ubuntu have a tendency to make more user visible changes to programs anyway. So yeah. the changes that Ubuntu make will be more user visible than the ones that Debian make, mm -hmm. usually. So, and uh, I guess one of the issues I brought up too when this came around was that. Uh, DFSG8 sort of prohibits us from having a license that's specific to to Debian, and I sort of brought this up as an objection to having a trademark license that was only for Debian and not necessarily for anyone who was uh, deriving us. And <coughs> I think on the, when the, the first round of this happened, and we were discussing all this, not, not the current, not the not the current sort of kerfuffle about redeeming ties. So the first time this came up in 2005, I guess it was. Um, the compromise that we struck was that if, if, the, if the downstream did not modify the package in any way, they were considered to have this sort of carte blanche trademark license. They could, they could use the package downstream as, but if they did modify it, they, they were not entitled to be able to use the, the Firefox <coughs> trademark automatically. So I don't know if this is, this is the compromise that the project wants to accept in general for this sort of thing, or if we want to think about it more, or I don't know. But certainly, I don't know if it's fair to the downstream uh, derivers of us, who are now very many, to actually have to go through and resolve trademark issues if they derive from Debian, whereas, which they wouldn't have to do with it, because obviously copyright issues have been fairly well taken care of. Uh, and I mean, <coughs> to draw a parallel to patents, if, some, if, if a large software company well, Microsoft came to us and offered us sort of a patent deal that was applied only to Debian. Uh, 
uh, I don't think we would take it. So obviously, these sorts of things, uh, these sorts of getting specific deals are not, I mean, not the trademarks and patents are the same thing, they're not. And patents are much more horrible, I guess, or painful to resolve or problematic than trademarks could ever be, but I'm not sure if we want to go down the road of any specific trademark licenses just for Debian ourselves. The general principle is that for something to be considered free by Debian is that everybody else, also not just Debian, has to have exactly all of the same freedoms that Debian has. Right. And basically that Debian doesn't get some kind of special deal because we are trying to preserve the freedom of our users to, to modify and derive and all the rest of it. True. But the fact is that, I mean, these things were drawn up, the Debian Free Software Alloys were drawn up with copyright in mind, and obviously that's very important uh, to not have a Debian specific license. Because trademarks are easier to get around, because all you have to do is rename it, maybe we want to be a bit more, I don't know, uh, not so liberal about it. Because of the fact that the also the upstreams, the, the, the owners of the trademarks actually need to protect, need to maintain such a, a very tight control, a much tighter control than they do in, with respect to copyrights over the use of the trademark. So it's very hard for them to come up with a license that's acceptable for use of the trademark, unless it's something like, I mean, the classic example is, is this is actually trade, I think it's actually a copyright thing, but, but Tackett had a had sort of a compatibility suite that uh, I'm sure you know, speed ball to death. Uh, the, <coughs> but there was a test suite that you had to pass to be able to call yourself tech, which is a very reasonable way of doing this from from our, our very developer perspective, our very you know, technical uh, centric world view, where that makes a lot of sense. But programs like Firefox and stuff don't have these kind of like test suites and. And a lot of a lot of GUI applications, it's hard to sort of say that this is because it's so tied to the look and feel of it to some degree. It's much harder to say whether this is actually to create like a test method to to test whether it looks right. Also, to <laughs> some extent, tech was grandfathered, right? Yeah, because it was done such a long time ago, and so on and so forth. So I think if you had a similar program nowadays, you might well find that the answer was different. I don't know. It seems like a fairly reasonable thing to require because just for the same reason as as uh, for the same reason as that I don't want to be associated. If you if you've gone and taken my program and modified it substantially enough that I don't really want to be associated with it anymore because it I don't know. So those things I don't want it to do. Then in the past, what like, mainly happened in the free software world is that the name of the program has not been treated as a trademark and. If somebody takes your program and does some crazy thing with it, then you send them insults, not lawsuits. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, so and yeah. and this, by and large, has worked very well. And the answer to these kind of things about oh well, otherwise we can't lose our trademark is just to say well we won't. We have to call the program something that's not the trademark then, because it's just the legal system for dealing with trademarks is really hostile for all these reasons you've described. It's hostile to the things that we need to do for free software and doesn't fit at all well. So it's all right if there's, I mean, we don't really mind if there's a trademark which may or may not be enforced by somebody at some point. We can sort of, you know, as you say, bury our heads in the sand. But when people come to us and start making difficulties and say we have to change the name of the program if we do this or that, the, for a derivative, right? I mean, it's not very well for Ubuntu. Ubuntu can change the name of their program in, 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 in Ubuntu, and we've got a couple of dozen developers to do that. Right. But most derivatives are not that yeah. large and not that well funded. And changing the name of some well integrated program is a serious matter. But uh, tell me, well, in major jurisdictions, uh, uh, if, if you distribute something that's under trademark, uh, well, uh, uh, if you lose the 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 sue uh, sue or whatever, uh, it is uh, going backwards. I mean, it is retroactive. You you cannot just say we change it from now on. 
Are you doing any extreme myself? I got a bit confused. You mean that, like, yeah, uh, for that example, they can sue you retroact, like, you've been using the name for three years, yes. and they'll like, retroactively they sue you for... They can it. only sue you for actual damages, yeah. in general, I think which is almost impossible for them to prove I in, think in a case like this. What he says would be something like, you could be compelled to change it in all your history and mm -hmm. make the name disappear, and it would be hard for us to do because... In a certain sense, I mean, we have snapshot and we have old versions of the archive and mm -hmm. we have release distributions and things. Yeah, right? I, I, I'm not so sure that that would be necessary because I think that, I mean, it's possible they would compel us to change it in the current release, but it's not like we can reach into people's computers and, and take it away. Uh, I think as long as we are not, like our current software is not distributing it because, we can, especially if we can point and say, no one's using any of this old stuff or this is purely for archival purposes, it's probably not a big deal. But again, I, I, I'm, not theory, a, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know. In theory, that, I think theory, that might be a problem. In practice, I think for trademarks, that's not going to be a problem, basically because trademarks are just about, you know, the goodwill associated to some name. And the enormous shitstorm that would arise if a trademark holder were to, to go down that path, would I think probably inhibit them. With patents, we're very much more at risk there. And it's very clear that they could demand yeah. um, they could demand everything to be pulled from the archive, they could demand all sorts of things in principle. Um, that's happened in court, you know, there were actual physical objects that were recalled because they were patent violations. Um, and the person who distributed them was made by a court to offer the people who'd been given them originally as some kind of freebie gift was made to buy them back from the from the consumers. So it's patent is really scary, but so but in any yeah, case, it's an entirely different conversation yeah. really. Yeah but in any case we should change the name also in stable in case. We would probably have to change it. I mean yeah if, if this ever came to a head and in a court or or really became a problem we'd probably have to change it in stable because that's what people think. In, in practice if it came to that we would change the branding in stable and not the package name that's true because to change the package name in stable that's clearly functional yeah mm -hmm. and we would be able to because changing the package name would break systems and cause yeah cause things to break so <clears throat> yes what kind of licenses most like ada where they said you had to pass a test suite in order to call your compiler a an ADA compiler. Right. What kind of license? So that, that sounds like the, the historical sort of tech license where this is covered by the, the Debian Free Software Patent license. It's, it's fairly reasonable sort of thing to ask. Uh, I don't really see a problem with that in general. Did it actually have a trademark on ADA? Uh, I don't know. Was it just was actually a copyright license that said that? I have no idea of the legal situation. Right. I just know that they. Yeah, so I mean that's that's very similar to what tech had at one point. I think I didn't think it does anymore, but it's, uh, that's easier for a distributor to deal with because yeah. they'll be able to tell yeah. when they they don't need we don't need to go to a third party and like look for okay we don't need to go to a third party and ask them for permission as would have been the case with, with Firefox. We can just run a test suite and say whether this we can if we can literally run a program to tell us whether we can call it ADA or not. It's yeah, mm -hmm. fine, I think. Yeah, it's very useful. Same, seems like it. Yeah, yeah. It would be used by everybody. Absolutely, but the problem with, with like a pure, like a more graphical environment is that it's harder to test for things like does it look how I think it should look, or because this is what they're more concerned with, I think, in Firefox and and, uh, and other stuff. Like they were, I think they, when they looked at our patches at one point, they were sort of confused by I don't know. We we had increased the the dialog window size and the preferences dialog, and they thought this was kind of a a crazy, you know, they were very concerned about these sorts of like minor modifications to to the look and feel that, you know, really didn't amount to a whole lot, didn't really change the, the program in any substantial way, but, you know, these would be harder things to test for, probably. So, I think we've got one last slide here. Yeah, the computer is screwed up here. All right, well, the last slide was talking about. Um, name forking, and if we actually end up having to do something similar to the ISUSA situation, how should we handle it? Because I, I don't know how, if I handled it as well as could have been handled, because of things like the new ISUSA and, and 
I don't think anyone else besides Debbie is using the name. Maybe some of our drivers are, but certainly not a lot of the larger drivers are using it. Um, so, I mean, one of the points is that the reason why these white companies think have trademarks on the software is because they want to they want to create a brand. They want to create you know recognition of this thing. And if we fork the name, we're losing out on all that sort of branding, free advertising, and and goodwill and and sort of association with that. So I was trying to come up with ideas, or, or wonder if anyone else has ideas about how to create recognition for uh, sort of a name fork if we have to do it. And I think I'm hoping it won't become more popular, but the fact is that that open source software is becoming kind of a big business, and companies are probably looking for ways to keep a, a tighter control over the uh, the software that they produce, and you know, to create that sort of branding and recognition, and and sort of sell that uh, in the various ways that they're they're making money without selling the software so much. Well, I think this is less of a problem than than you seem to think it is. I, the, the most unfortunate thing about this was the Google Ice Weasel thing that was really, mm. you know, in terms of of Debian's handling of it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the situation was rather bad, but there's some unique things about the. Firefox case. So what happened was originally we had a very liberal trademark license and we thought we were all right. And then that trademark was transferred to an organization which was more full of suits and lawyers. Yeah. And that's more rare a case, particularly that there's some trademark which is actually owned by some relatively benign organization and then it gets transferred to something less benign. It does happen occasionally. There was the, the MIT X thing. Um, but I don't think we need to worry about it that much. Also, it was a very highly visible spat. And within the free software world, mm -hmm. it didn't, I don't think it did, uh, certainly, uh, you know, certain, lots of people would have thought, oh, that's just Debian being awkward again. But well, I think that, that sort of attitude sort of persists, actually, even to this day, that we were seen to be sort of the villain or, or the, the crazy people asking, so much for, for uh, you know, from this wonderful program that everyone loves and and right. it's amazing. Right. And, and there was a lot of like, there was a lot of like, people really liked the logo. There was a lot of visceral like, I love this logo, and anything else that you do to touch it, I hate you now. So are you so you should speak to people like FreeBSD developers, right? Who don't care about all this weird political shit, <laughs> right? But if you talk to them about stuff like the GFDL. Problem and the ice weasel thing, and they they say, well, "What was that anyway?" And they, they don't start out thinking, you know, one side or the other was right. No. And some of them have got a, you know, sometimes some BSD developers got a thing against Debian, and some don't. But I think it's much less one-sided than, than you might think. <coughs> uh, I, I'm sure that you know the unwashed masses all think Debian is being evil and awkward, but. Debian are always being evil and awkward in that sense, and really, it's those unwashed masses we're trying to protect, and we'll just we'll just carry on doing what we think is right for them, and they can go. Home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that's certainly one point of view, but I mean, I don't think we want the unwashed masses to go away. I think we want the unwashed masses to come to us, and uh, I think I think the, the only answer to that is if you want Ubuntu, you know where to find it. Right. Really, to be honest. And you know, with, I say that with my Debian hat firmly planted on my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if if we start not following the DFSG, we just give away from what Debian is, and it's it's all brands that we're going to break. So I'm not saying anything about going away from the DFSG. I'm saying in the case where we have to do this sort of forking, uh, I guess I'm saying we need to. We could prove know, our perhaps it. it sounds horrible, but advertise or to promote ourselves, to promote yeah. the the fact that. You know, to, to come off looking less like the bad guy. Which I think we came off the last time looking kind of like the bad guy, even though I, I don't feel like it worked. The impression was not that much of a god, uh, bad guy, but uh, of an uh, extremist, of uh, taking everything right, exactly. And well, yeah. that's right, and that's a compliment in the end. <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly, no, no, no. I, I spoke to some Mozilla people about this, and, and, and what, you know, there I was with my Ubuntu. Firefox maintainer hat on talking to these Mozilla guys who were basically suits from Mozilla. And they thought that the real problem was that you, particularly you, had had some kind of interpersonal, right, that 
kind of span. They thought that, that what was needed was you and them to sit down in a pub and have a couple of beers and then, you know, meet each other and it will be fine. Right? And they just really didn't get the problem at all, right? And you could read this mailing list, I read the mailing list message where it was, you know, they, they posted this one message where they said, no, no, we need these things and they're not, you know, we, we just, you know, I'm sure we can talk about it, but really we need these things. And you and I think also Russ Nelson or somebody followed up and said, well, this is just impossible. We cannot, we just cannot, uh, no. we cannot go there and that's just not possible for us. And they, the, the idea that something is actually possible for somebody doesn't exist in their minds. They think that there's always some kind of, you know, quid pro quo or some, oh, nice. right? And yeah. Debian, Debian is very inflexible, right? Mo most of the time we give everything away and we say, yes, go ahead, do whatever you like. If you come to Debian and say, we want to do something you don't currently permit, Debian usually says no. And the reason for that is that we've already decided to permit, explicitly permit, all of the things that we think are a good thing. Yeah. And anything that we think is bad, we're not permitting. It's, we're already something we think is, is, is improper. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's true. It's, it's very true. And I think I've... Yeah, we should get that out of time, but I think, yeah, I, I... What you should have done is you should have written one of those articles like the, like Debian Legal did for the um, GFDL thing. Right. You should have written a kind of, you know, this and that and just explain more what clearly and posted it to, you could have it posted to Debian. Well, and the thing is, in the end, the, the, the GFDL thing was needed because it was such a long argument. I mean, the, Mozilla, the Firefox ice whistle was not uh, mi minor, but I think it, it's not uh, worth that much time to explain right. and I explain. Mean, the thing is that there's no, all these people yeah. who say they really don't understand why Debian has yeah. gone down the path. Yeah. 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 A lot of people again, I mean, the games team, we are having, we're probably having lots of problems with trademarks. Mm -hmm. Because some games, for example, right now we have in the repositories, we have uh, Super Mario Chronicles that uses Mario characters in Mario's oh, world, yeah. which are copyrighted. <laughs> and also, some games out there uh, use the um, environment or characters of Star Trek or things like that. Yeah. And at some point, we will have to fork or replace all that stuff. Yeah. Or, so, it, it, for us, it's, it's going to become a really big problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll probably face that with the half of. of our game, so yeah. and so on. So I'm really interested in the, in the standard solution for this. Yeah, and, yeah. I, I, it would be great to come up with, a, I guess, a, anyway, as guidelines as much as possible what we should be doing, and and trying not to look like we're being unreasonable or inflexible, or, especially when we're facing an organization that's really popular, like or considered very reputable, like the the Free Software Foundation, to sort of go against them, the Mozilla, the Mozilla Foundation, or whatever. To go against them is sort of perceived as even if the facts are there, the initial reaction is like these people are oh, crazy. I think we should be less worried about our image, right? Who else could have faced out the Free Software Foundation and got what they wanted? <laughs> it's just our moral authority is pretty much impeccable, right. and we should just we should explain why we're doing what we're doing, and we shouldn't worry too much that people will think ill of us. Yep. An example of that, I posted to the mailing list, uh, the unwashed mass masses uh, thinking we are evil strangers. I mean, we're not giving them Microsoft Office, so we are evil, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> some things you can't do, it's the cost of I mean, doing I agree, business. I, I agree, I agree cool. that, that we're never going to win everyone, but yeah. I think we should try as hard as we can to to appeal to people and to, oh, to get them to you know understand our point of view and to come on board with us, because sure. I mean, that's... We want to keep growing as a project. We definitely need more. We always need more people. And it's, uh, it's still a threat for the free software and the general. Uh, so it's yeah. Yeah, but you're right. As you said, we should. Anyway. So the idea right now, in in any case, the similar to this one, is to say to to follow the same path you described before, like ignoring the problem until it is enforced. I think probably. I mean, that's the best technique to go because again. I think most free software developers and no, people are, are happy with us, and and we're not like we're not doing crazy things to their packages in general. So you know, the, well, the Apache Foundation are not even threatening to sue our downstreams. Yeah. So that's okay. Yeah. yeah if the Apache Foundation start 
looking at their trademark license and saying, actually, then we'll go, oh, for fuck's sake, please don't make us do rename a patch. Yeah. And this time, they'll know we're not bluffing. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right? I think I think Mozilla yeah. might have thought we were bluffing. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm probably facing that in our in our group in the games team quite often. So I mean, I'm, I have to find a solution to to that one. Right. I think yeah. I think the game's going to be really tough, and you might end up renaming a lot of them. And I'm sorry yeah. about that, but it's just really those games companies. They're not free software companies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, like uh, I have to. Try to talk about Disney out of this. Yeah, of course, but uh, I mean, some companies, for example, we, we have some remakes of old games that are <coughs> not being enforced, like for example, the Three Lives of Glory or things like that, that are the 80s games or something like that, and probably some, some, other, some other characters, like for example Mario, for example Mickey Mouse, will probably won't ever be able to put them in a game, because, yeah. because of course mm -hmm. Disney is quite picky about that, but I mean, uh, we do, we I don't think we can go to an extreme because otherwise we'll, we wouldn't even have it's a game. I mean, I mean when, you, when, you see, when you see obvious things like they're using Mickey Mouse, yeah, it's right. You know that these a lot of these corporations are very strongly you know going to come after people who do this. Yeah, I know. If they get any sort of visibility, you should, you should try to work with the stream as much as possible to sort of explain. Look, you're just in a game that has this character. You're, this could be troublesome for you and for me and for anyone who wants to. You know, use your game. Yeah, because it's it's two problems uh, quite different. One, one is when we pass, package something that's trademark of uh, of our upstream, and, uh, and it's very different when we package something that say uh, that the upstream yeah. also is not a holder of the trademark. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, but I mean most of the um, of I mean some some of uh, of the companies, the games company, are quite clear. I mean we shouldn't package Mario or shouldn't package mm -hmm. Mickey Mouse, but some other stuff it's not really that clear because it's not being enforced. So yeah, you, never know, you never know which company have, has bought all the assets of the company yeah, yeah. that has so uh, gone if out it's of not being, If it's not being enforced and we can show we've been distributing this game for five years, then we will be able to win in court. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because they failed to enforce it. The so whole it's, point, it's yeah. actually a good if yeah. it's not being enforced, right? The trademarks are often a bad thing. And we, we you know, I think as a project, you know, sometimes they're they're a thing that we might want to oppose and it, it, if it's getting in the way and nobody's enforcing it, go ahead. That's definitely the best thing to be doing. Anyway, and if somebody complains, we can. Okay. And possibly don't send an email to them saying we're ready. Right, right. Yes. Exactly. Ignore the problem. Yeah, and not sending any time. Yeah, yeah don't worry. I'm not sending <laughs> any email to Mr. Disney. Oh, but <laughs> right. 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 Okay. like won't it sound? Won't answer. Don't yeah, okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.